Hey everyone, so today on the channel I'm discussing the slightly delayed but highly anticipated Dune Part 2 from visionary filmmaker Denis Villeneuve. If you guys are familiar with my channel then you'll know I was a big fan of Part 1. It was one of my favourite films of 2021. I haven't read the book by Frank Herbert, I still haven't by the way, but Denis Villeneuve did a magnificent job of getting me excited and invested in the world of Arrakis. So, I was hungry for more of the Dune story. Dune Part 1, despite being released during the pandemic, still managed to make a huge impact on the cinematic landscape. It won six Oscars and was one of the most beloved films of that year by both critics and audiences. So yeah, Denis set the bar very high on himself. Like he already knocked my socks off once. Was he gonna be able to knock them off again? But then I think to myself, Silly Luke, like, in Denis, we trust. It gives me immeasurable pleasure to say that Dune Part 2 somehow manages to surpass Part 1 in pretty much every way. We are looking at a rare find here, okay? A genuinely, truly bigger and better sequel. Like, and I will say this, you do need to watch part one before you watch part two. Part one was our introduction to the characters and the world of Arrakis. There was a lot of setup and exposition. It set the tone and got the plot wheels in motion, but part two is where the story really happens. The plot kicks off immediately where part one left us with Paul Atreides, played by Timothy Chalamet, and his mother, Lady Jessica, played by Rebecca Ferguson, in the desert on Arrakis. They are with the Fremen. They're learning the ways of the Fremen. All the while, Paul is plotting his revenge against those that orchestrated the obliteration of House Atreides, that mainly being Baron Harkonnen, played by Stellan Skarsgård, and The Emperor, played in this film by Christopher Walken. The reason part two is an objectively better film than part one is because every aspect of this film has leveled up, okay? The plot is more pacing, the action set pieces are more grand and ambitious, the world building is more expansive, the character growth is more compelling, the music more soul-stirring, but it never loses sight of what the first film established and what made it interesting. The rival houses making moves for power, the political scheming, as well as the more mythical and religious aspects of the story, okay? It builds upon all of that. That's what a good sequel is supposed to do. It builds upon what made the first film interesting. And when you build, you're supposed to build it bigger and better and that's what it does. I don't really feel the need to go into extensive detail about the tech and craft side of this film because you can see from the trailer that the costumes, the production design, the visual effects, the sound, all of that is self-evidently impressive. Every one of those departments has had a glow up here. I was kind of expecting that because they have more money with this one, but what really surprised me about this film was the departments where I didn't think they'd be able to top themselves, they still managed to do that. Like I was going into this thinking, there is no way that Hans Zimmer can outdo what he did in the first film. He won the flipping Oscar for it, but man was I wrong. I have been blasting this score everywhere that I go, okay? The track, Only I Will Remain, oh my God. The first film made bagpipes sound cool, but this one you've got throat singing, electric guitars, and church organs to make it feel even more epic. Greg Fraser did the same thing. He outdid what he did in the first one. The cinematography in these Dune movies is actual art, in my opinion. There's certain shots in the first one, you know, which are, you know, jaw-dropping, but there were certain sequences in this, like involving the sandworms, where I felt, as an audience member, like the size of a grain of sand, like compared to the canvas of Dune Part 2. It's absolutely spectacular. It's gorgeous to behold, especially in IMAX. If you can see an IMAX, oh my god, treat yourself. I also think the screenplay is an improvement from John Space and Denis Villeneuve. Like, it just feels more relaxed now that the bulk of the exposition is out of the way, but it also feels more textured and steeped in allegory. Paul is kind of seen as this messiah-like figure to some of the Fremen, but the story really does lean into the idea of faith. Normally, blockbusters and religion don't really mix well together. They can come across a bit preachy, but I actually appreciated the religious themes of this film. I know not everybody will, but I did. Like in the real world, religion is something that everybody has a different relationship with, okay? It's complex, just as it is on Arrakis. Religion can be a source of hope, like to some characters like Javier Bardem Stilgar, but it can also be viewed as a poison, a distraction, or a form of slavery to other characters like Zendaya's Chani. There's also more humor in this film's script, and not in a 
forced humor kind of way, like other big franchise movies that we get these days. After watching part one, I didn't think that Javier Bardem would be a comic relief character in this film, but genuinely he is one of the funniest characters in this film because he's kind of a Paul Atreides fanboy, but in the most sincerest way possible. Yeah, he was fab, but while we're on the topic of performances, the whole cast in this shines. Timothy Chalamet just keeps getting stronger and stronger with each subsequent project that he does. There is a lot of character growth for Paul Atreides in this film, okay? Because Dune is essentially a coming of age story about Paul Atreides, you know? In part one, he was still quite boyish and still had a lot to learn about his gifts. Then part two, he really taps into the darker aspects of the character, his anger, his thirst for vengeance, and there's a commanding intensity that Chalamet brings to the role, which I've never really seen him do before, but he's just proving to the world just how versatile of a performer he actually is. Zendaya thankfully gets more to do in this one than just looking over her shoulder like she's in a perfume ad. In this one, she is the master of shady side eye, like some of her looks in this set me off, but she is great as the headstrong, fierce, and realist Charney. And she and Chalamet have that googly-eyed chemistry. She and Chalamet, there's a tongue twister for you. She and Chalamet shall seashells by the seashore. In terms of new additions to the cast, Austin Butler definitely gets the most to work with here as the psychotic yet ambitious Fade. And it was cool to see a different side of Austin Butler, seeing him play someone who's vicious and cruel and a bit of a sadomasochist. Like, credit where credit is due, he made a magnetic psychopath. For those of you wondering, no, he doesn't sound like Elvis in this, but he does sound an awful lot like Stellan Skarsgård. Like, he's really channeling him in his cadence and his delivery. I'll give him this, Austin Butler is a very good mimic. I will say I would have appreciated a little bit more from Christopher Walken and Florence Pugh who played the Emperor and his daughter, um, Princess Arulin. I enjoyed what they were doing, but I just wanted a bit more from them. I also wasn't sure going into this film how Denis Villeneuve was gonna up the ante in terms of sheer spectacle, but my God, he found a way. In hindsight, part one was just an amuse-bouge and part two is like the main course. Honest to God though, the action set pieces in this film, I don't wanna go into too much detail about them because I don't wanna spoil it for you guys, but it's rare to be truly stunned by what a film can pull off. Like the, the true moments of cinematic wonder and awe, like seeing the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park for the first time or, you know, feeling that sense of weightlessness while watching Gravity. But yeah, Doom Part 2 has something in here which is very, very special. Like, it's like the cinematic equivalent of riding a roller coaster, okay? That's all I'll say. But my God, in that set piece, I felt like I was in it. I got the tingles, I got goosebumps, okay? My jaw was on the floor in awe. It's just one of those rare, indelible cinematic moments that you get from watching something like this on the big screen for the first time that you never forget. It will stay with me forever and I will treasure it. I can't stress this enough, okay? Watch this film in a cinema, in IMAX if you can. Live it, live in that moment, okay? This is a true cinematic experience. Shall we discuss its Oscars chances? I know it's got a long distance to travel before the 2025 Oscars, but I do think Doom Part 2 is gonna repeat its success with Doom Part 1 in terms of Oscar nominations. Whether it will win all of them is another question. You guys remember that Denis Villeneuve was infamously snubbed for Doom Part 1. I do think he deserves a directing nomination for a culmination of Part 1 and Part 2, okay? Because the man pulled off the impossible, okay? He made an unadaptable novel work. I do have to wonder though, if Doom Part 2 hadn't been delayed till 2024, then how much of a threat would it have been to Oppenheimer in some of the tech categories like score, cinematography, editing, sound? Hands down, Dune Part 2 would have won for visual effects, but would it have really challenged Oppenheimer in any of the other categories? But I do want to hear from you guys. Let me know in the comment section down below how many Oscar nominations do you think Dune Part 2 is going to get? And would it have been a challenger to Oppenheimer if it had come out in the same year. So let's ask them three questions. Firstly, would I watch this again? Doi. <laughs> like this movie is an all timer. It's gonna be watched many, many more times. Expect to see it on the wall at some point. Question two, do I recommend it for you guys? If you liked Doom part one, you are going to love Doom part two. If you didn't like Doom part one, then I will say Doom part two is a more engaging second half, but it's still a blockbuster made by an auteur, okay? It's not just empty spectacle, okay? It's telling a vast, 
thematically rich and intelligent story. So if you didn't really like Doom Part 1, then odds are Doom Part 2 won't be your cup of tea either. But even still, I highly recommend this film to everyone. This is big blockbuster cinema at its finest, okay? Go see it on the biggest screen you can and let it wash over you. And third question, what score to give it out of 10? Doom Part 2 freaking slaps and was absolutely worth the wait. I love the first film, but I probably love this one more and I gave the first film a 10 out of 10, so how can I go higher than that? <laughs> I can't really give it an 11 out of 10, that's not a thing. So yeah, I'm just gonna say that Doom Part 2 is like a gold star 10 out of 10 movie for me and a film that everybody should watch at least once before they die. Like it's the highest honor I can give a film like this. But as always guys, it's just one bloke's opinion. I would love to hear your thoughts on Doom Part 2, whatever you have to say about this movie. Let me know in that comment section down below. If you've enjoyed the video, help me out with a little thumbs up button. If you want more movie TV and Oscars related content, don't forget to click subscribe. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. For more things related to movies, TV, the Oscars, and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Carefield, and I'll see you next time.